Right. So, welcome everybody. This is our Nature Journal Club workshop. Um, I'm John Laws, and today what we're going to be doing is taking a look at a bag of tri tricks to uh, completely revolutionize the way that you use your Nature Journal. What I'm going to try to do today is to take you and your journal from this to this. Right? So this the picture, the portrait of the bird in the middle of the page is a wonderful thing to do. There's nothing wrong with that. Right? However, I think that you will, um, I'm going to suggest to you today that there is a way of using your journal that is much more fun, engaging, creative, and um, will help you observe more deeply. If you can start to, on the page of your journal, develop a conversation between yourself and nature. And the journal is the interpreter. And there are ways of using your journal that will allow you to pull out much more richness and insight from the experiences that you have. And the purpose of it is not to make one drawing that is beautiful. The purpose of it is to have some sort of a process which is going to help you observe, which is going to help you remember what you see, and is also going to make you more curious about the world around you and the world that you're in. And I find that that just makes the whole process so much more fun. The more fun it becomes for you, the more likely you are to do it on a regular basis. And what we're trying to do is try to get ourselves to the point where journaling becomes an obsessive habit. And habits are really, really interesting. If you've got a habit you're trying to break, it's very, very difficult. If you've got a habit you're trying to create, that's difficult. But once something is your pattern, it really starts to take care of itself and feed itself. And by making the whole thing more fun and more interesting, what you're doing is making it more likely that you'll just be journaling all the time. And so there's a teeter-totter balance, and right now, Perhaps, you know, it's difficult to get your journal out and it's a hassle. The more engaging and delightful and fun it is, the more it becomes such an important part of the way that you see the world. You just start doing it more and more and more and more. And when the teeter-totter tips that way, it just is reinforcing itself and taking care of itself. You can't think of going on a little expedition and not bringing your journal with you. What are chances, you know, like, oh, if I only had my journal here with me, what, I wonder what else I would see or think about. So I'm going to try to show you some ways to help you go from here to there. When you want to do that, that's still perfectly fine to do. But I'm going to suggest that there's a whole lot more richness waiting out there. If you can get this conversation between you and nature going in front of you. I want to take a look at a way, an example of uh, an experience that I had, sort of where my, the process of journaling helped pull me into an investigation. If I had not been journaling, I wouldn't have been able to go on this sort of series of discoveries. And it started out before our Little Nature Journal Club went on a trip to Radio Road Ponds. I went out there ahead of time to kind of get a sense of what was there, what we would expect to see. And while I was out there, I drew a picture of one of the pintail ducks that was being very cooperative and hanging out right in front of me. And I decided to kind of push things a little bit further. Why don't I just sort of see if I can identify what are the parts of its plumage. You know, what are the tertial feathers? Where can I see the primary feathers? Can I sort of name the parts of that bird? Just as a, as a, as a morphological exercise for myself. And I did that on, on the pages of the journal. And as I did, I realized I was actually looking at one big spot on the side of the bird that didn't make any sense to me. I didn't know what feathers were making that spot. And I looked at some books, and some people said, oh, that's part of the wing. And, but then I thought, I looked at some wings of pintails, and that did not make any sense to me. I said, no, that can't be the wing. What's going on here? It didn't make any sense to me. So I put a big question mark and just left myself a note. What's up with this black spot? What is that black spot? Because I did that, that question and that experience stuck on some neurons in the back of my head. So that when we went out to Radio Road as a group, and somebody found a dead pintail. I went, oh, I was, this is my opportunity to see what's up with that black spot. 
So I kind of looked through those feathers and I discovered that the black spot, it's not part of the wing, but it actually is the, the upper scapular feathers look one way, the ones closer to the belly, um, not towards the middle of the back, have this curved black spot right there in the feathers. It was the scapular, some of the back feathers. Like, wow, that's really, really cool. It was a fun discovery. I would not have been so attracted to this dead duck had I not already had this question kind of percolating in my head. But because I did that, I was then thinking about dead ducks. And dead ducks are now on my radar. And then I start looking around the pond, and I started to see that actually out here, there are a bunch of dead ducks. There's a lot of dead ducks out here, so I started to count them. I just walked around the edge of the pond, and I went, one, two, three. There's a lot of dead ducks out here. And so I counted them. I had 38 dead ducks. It's a lot of dead ducks. And so that then led me, if you... I, I started to kind of think it through, but think it through on paper. We can be really sloppy and lazy in our questioning processes, how we think about things. And actually mapping your thoughts out on paper really helps you be much more articulate in your thinking process about what you're doing. So I thought to myself, so, so what's going on here? What's happening with these dead ducks? And I came up with some possibilities of what could be going on. So if this could be injury, what could be some things injuring it? Is that disease? What could it be getting, well, how could it be getting sick? Right. Is there something else that I'm not thinking of? Right? And be intentional about that. What are sort of clues, other clues that kind of fit into this? And what this is, is a conversation between nature and your brain, mediated through the, 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 the page of that journal. This is, a, this is your brain on paper. And what you want to do is see if you have any questions and explore the world through this. I would not have been sort of curious about this and followed this line of thought had I not been slowing down and processing things through my journal. It turns out that our day out there at Radio Road, we were just at the breaking point of a wave of avian cholera that swept through that pond killing more than 100 ducks till they drained it um, to uh, get rid of the, the disease-causing agents in the pond. And it's still, they're still trying to, to treat that. So it was amazing to be there. And what we what, what are actually seen here is this is, the, this is the canary in the coal mine, which I wouldn't have seen had I not been slowed down and made to be more thoughtful by this process. So what I want to do is to suggest to you that there are some very specific things that I'm doing intentionally on this page that help me be more curious, that help me kind of get out of just using this to make a portrait of something, but as a way of exploring the world. And so what I did is I tried to think of, can I come up with a list of what are some discrete, separate things that you can include on a journal page, or ways that you can conduct an investigation on your journal page that will open up doors to discovery. And so what I want to do today is go through a number of little elements that you can insert into your journal page and it makes the whole process richer and more fun. These first list is, these are things that can kind of go into any little journal page. These ones over here are specific ways of playfully conducting an investigation on your journal page. And I want to kind of give you examples and kind of a definition of that to give you an idea of some of the room that you have to play with your nature journal. So let's start with this one right here, the metadata. This is a fancy word for put your date, location, and that basic information somewhere on your page. That's the metadata. The metadata is the data behind the data. Where are you? What time of year is it? What time of day is it, if that's important? What's the weather like? The sort of, those background things that in the moment you may not think are important, but later on when you realize that this was right before that epidemic hit, I want, it'd be interesting to know what time of year that was. Right? That's automatically on your page. So just to start habitually including that, 
on your page. So here's a little, a little inset map showing where the burrowing owl colony is. Where is that um, uh, uh, in Sierra Valley? Um, where are you? When is it? I often will put in a little icon for the weather. So if it's a, if it's a sunny day, I'll go like that. Sorry for the squeaks. If it's partially cloudy, you, know, you can have the, that little symbol. Um, I just recently, on April Fool's Day, got to do one that I never have been out sketching before in. It was the first time I ever got to draw that little icon. I mostly went out that day because I wanted a chance to do that. Like, I've never drawn in a thunderstorm. And uh, let's see what happens. So, you'll get to see that picture in a moment. Um, so, the metadata. That's step number one. Just adding that in takes your, your page from being, you know, some drawings and notes about something to really useful scientific information. This turns it into a scientific document by adding that little bit of metadata. The second is objective observation. I want to let the scientist in me out to play. I want to look articulately at the world and describe it using writing, using drawing, as clearly as I can. The purpose of this isn't to make a pretty picture, but an interesting thing is that very often, if you're trying to really explain something, the beauty of that explanation, the beauty of, um, of those details can come through and creates a whole kind of art in itself. So often it doesn't really matter that the drawing isn't necessarily something that's lovely, but the, there can be really beauty in, in, in how you are explaining something. This was a little discovery which we made up on Hawk Hill. We put some stones on our journal so that the pages wouldn't blow around as we were sharing them. And then we noticed that on the edges of the shadow of those little pebbles, if you looked at it really carefully, there was a little red edge on the side that was closest to you and a blue edge on the side that was furthest away from you. And you'd see that when, even when you switch sides, that the blue and the reds would shift. And so there's something optically going on that physicists maybe understand. But for me, it was complete mystery. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. And what I tried to do is to describe that. Here's the color of the shadow that was in there. Right? Using writing, using drawing, as articulately and specifically as I, as I could. And whether or not it ends up being a pretty picture doesn't matter. It's, this is an opportunity for exploring deeply into the data. Often thinking about what you're doing as creating a diagram is more useful than thinking about creating a drawing. Um, the diagram takes all the pressure off the pretty picture. And it gives you some ideas of, you know, how could I reframe this, look at this from a different way, to, to get myself to see this with new eyes. So here, here's this little flower. I've drawn it from the front and the side. Little arrow says, that's what's going on in here. I don't have to get in here and draw little careful flowers on all of these. This tells the story. Here's a diagram of the leaf patterns of these sorts of things. And what I want to think about is how can I communicate what's going on here? Doing that also helps me be very clear about what am I really seeing about what's happening in front of me. Very often you'll be out there and be sketching a picture and you realize that, oh no, this picture really isn't turning out the way that I wanted it to. This is, if you've got, so you sometimes get kind of wrapped around the axle about, I've got to make a pretty picture. If that ever happens to you, do not despair for two reasons. The first is I'm going to encourage you, really don't worry about the pretty pictures. If you want to make pretty pictures, just make lots of pictures. And pretty pictures will come. But then people will still be like, but still, you know, I'd, I'd rather actually have this thing on my page work. So here's some great sketch first aid. You don't like the picture? Just start adding little arrows in and written notes and turn it into a diagram and forget the pretty picture part. Just intentionally go, okay, I'm just going to turn this into a diagram, right? And it will completely change your focus of how you're looking at this thing. It becomes fun all over again. And it actually takes on a whole new kind of dynamism from the, all those notes and observations all put in there. There's a beauty in the data. And that comes through. That becomes the emphasis. 
and you kind of get you can get your you can kind of get yourself off of oh no this isn't a pretty picture you go okay I'm just going to diagram it just draw on some lines and it becomes fun all over again you can reclaim that set of observations not as a pretty picture but as a diagram let that be something that you're willing to do so you're not making a portrait you're documenting information in as many ways as you can if you ever get a chance to look at blueprints, like how to build a house, so you, somebody's got blueprints of a house, take a really careful look at it. Architects do amazing things, taking all of this, all this, telling somebody how to build a house on, on a two-dimensional piece of paper. That's incredible. And we can actually steal a lot of their ideas and use that to help us explore and discover. This is a drawing of an iris, but not done to make a pretty picture to help me understand the structure. So I'm sort of breaking it out. What are the component parts? Right. How do those fit together? A top view, a side view. Here's a cross section of right through this ovary right here. Right. How can you re-envision something to describe its structure? Um, so not worrying about having to make a pretty picture, I'm thinking about how can I really convey that information. So think about it as a way of collecting information. Here's an example. Of, some people go, oh, oh no, pine cone, scary thing to draw. Right? So here's a drawing of a pine cone without drawing a pine cone. And what I've got is the basic shape of the pine cone out here. I drew one diagonal row across it. Here's a close up of the scale. Here's a drawing of the seeds. This is diagrams of how the, the, the angle that the rows come across this. Here's how the scales look on the tips and in the middle. And a little note where I kind of disagreed with myself. So two seeds under every scale. Oh, no, not at the tips. Right? So there's a conversation here between myself and the pine cone, mediated through the journal, which helps me really be articulate about, articulate about what I'm seeing and what I'm not. Metadata, objective observation. What goes hand in hand with objective observation is your personal insight and feeling. Some people think of it like, no, I'm the objective scientist, I'm just, it's the facts, and I'm just reporting the facts. But we actually have an emotional response to being out there. If you really let yourself feel how you're feeling when you are out there in nature experiencing these things, let that go down on your page as well. All right? to give those shouts of joy to the beautiful, the miraculous, the things that we are grateful for. Find those things and shake them and hug them and put that into your journal. So here I was out in Sierra Valley and, and I see these ibis coming through the sky and I wrote, here are the dark silhouettes of ibis against a bright sky. As they turn west and settle into the field, they explode into iridescent fire and disappear into tall grass. That's letting part of how I feel about this be there on the page. And um, is it objective science? No. But I can bring some elements of, 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 did I start too early? No, I just realized I'm late. Oh, okay. I thought, I thought, okay, maybe I made really good time. It's good to see you. Um, so elements of, of the diary into your journal. It doesn't have to be all objective observation. You're the, the being through which this is all being filtered and interpreted. Let yourself be there too. And what that do, can do is bring kind of a greater intimacy between you and what you're experiencing and what you're observing. That can all be there. Um, so, not that you need permission, but you now have permission to do that. Um, this was just two days ago. I was at a, a local school doing a program with some really wonderful kids. We're out sketching and journaling out uh, under some oak trees. And I found this little oak sprout that was popped the acorn open and was starting to grow there. And I wrote some questions about it and was sort of describing it. And I also include some thoughts about you know what that made me think about. How did I feel about that? And letting myself kind of go there made that moment deeper for me through the process of noticing that I was feeling that and letting that be something that I would record. And that actually changed the way that I was feeling about that and I erased a little section at the top of this so that my little acorn could keep growing. <laughs> I 
here again, my birthday adventure. Just a little note about how being in nature made me feel. So you can let yourself also include that sort of subjective experience of how am I affected by this. And it's really interesting, if we are conscious of the things around us that we're really grateful for, that actually makes us happier people. Being intentional about sort of noticing what am I really grateful about here. One way of expressing that gratitude is celebrating in the pages of your journal. You've already seen a bunch of questions appearing in my journal, but I really want to highlight this because this is a critical factor for the way that I use my journal to explore. When I'm out there, if a question pops into my head, I just jot it down on the side of the paper. So as I'm going, I'm constantly kind of bopping over there and writing down those questions. One drawing of a flower can lead to all sorts of questions. So it's not just what are you observing in the details here, but what does that make you wonder about? And that intentional wondering and capturing those, those, those questions as they appear to you um, leads you in all sorts of interesting directions. Here's a little investigation curiosity adventure that I recently went on. I was at a pond, uh, a marsh near my house. I was looking at a group of shorebirds that were all resting by the side of the water. They were facing every which way. And same day, as the day went on, the wind began to blow. And as it did, all the birds, like wind socks, whoo, turned and faced their chests into that oncoming wind. And, and being out there recording that in my journal, that was, I was discovering something about what the way that, not just how the bird looks, but how it relates and orients itself in the environment that it's in. And that made me think about, kind of wonder about, like, how are birds orienting themselves? What direction are they facing? Maybe this is something I should pay attention to. And then, because I was already thinking about duck orientation, the next time that I was out on a pond a few days later, I found a group of ducks and discovered that the ducks were orienting themselves in a different way than the shorebirds. And what they were doing is that they made a little diagram. So here's another way of, of showing information. Didn't have to make a pretty picture of it. But here's the shore. Here's a little island with little arrows showing the directions that the ducks were pointing. They were all pointing with their chests pointed out into the water. And their heads turned around looking back over their shoulder. And that led me to think, you know, are ducks, do they keep their backs to the land for fast escape? It kind of makes sense that the duck is sliding into the water where the shorebird can just orient into the wind because it's going to be flying up into the air at the first sign of trouble. What they do at danger is going to be different sorts of things. Um, all those are questions that come directly from my observations. And what I really encourage people to do is to search out those questions that are stimulated by your observations. Not the sort of things that we're supposed to think we're supposed to ask, like the science facts, like how much does it weigh? How long can this live? What's its wing speed? Uh, you know, that's those, those sort of factoids are things that we memorize. These, the really rich questions, are things that are stimulated by little observation that you Connections is another extremely valuable and rich thing that you can add to your nature journaling page. And so as a connection, when I'm thinking about, when I'm looking at something, I'm saying, what does this remind me of? Have I ever seen anything like this before that's in one way similar to this or not? I was out looking at a, at a brown pelican, and it was on a little post, and as it was there, it was doing this. And it made me sort of remember being on a boat for a few days. And when I got off the boat and stepped onto land, I was still rocking. Right? So is, this, is this something that is going on with that? Is that sort of, you know, some sort of equilibrium thing that is going on? It kind of reminded me of that experience. Um, is it looking at a fish? Is it trying to triangulate on that? But sort of remembering that sort of kind of, so here's, here's a question. Here is a thing that it reminds me of, here's an observation. I'm intentional about collecting all these sorts of things. So I'll often say to myself, and for often I'll write in the front of my journal, I'll write, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. 
That is a mantra I use to stimulate myself to be more curious, to ask questions, to pay attention to what connections I can make, and to really focus on those new crystal observations. I notice, I wonder, and it reminds me of. Another thing that you can um, put into your journal, um, and this is, this is especially true for people who kind of start journaling from more of an artistic side, right, as opposed to a natural side. They think of what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out and I'm try to make a pretty picture of something. That's what we do in our journals. And that there's something bad and ugly about numbers and quantifying things. I'm here today to suggest to you that there is beauty in numbers. There is beauty and patterns that can be revealed to us through numbers if we let ourselves start to pay attention to them. So quantification, I'm talking about counting things. I'm talking about estimating things. I'm talking about measuring things. And letting that be a way of really focusing yourself in a different way. Doing this will get you to think differently than just making a picture of something. You start counting things, measuring things, your brain will start to operate and approach it in a different way. It's not better, it's not worse, it's different, and that's good. Also pay attention to scale. What are the size of the things? So quantification and scale. Here's a couple of examples of what I'm talking about. This page has several great examples of scale. I was drawing a, a western leather... Well, hey, I was punching my buttons. There we go. I was drawing a western leatherwood, and um, it's this wonderful sort of rare plant. We found it out on Jasper Ridge, fun day with Lena in the field. And what um, here is, here are three places that I'm um, keeping track of the scale of things. Next to the drawing, if I've drawn it life size, I'm writing one over one. It's a one to one ratio. This is drawn life size. I could also write life size, or actual size, right next to it. If I did it half size, I can go like that. If I'm drawing it twice as big, or five times as big, so five times as big would be five over one. I could also write times five. All of those are ways of showing scale. Here's another example of scale, right here. I don't have to get out there and measure the plant. But here's a little habit sketch of the plant growing up. You kind of see its bushiness and about the heights of it. And here's me, for scale, standing and drawing it right next to it. That gives you an idea of the height and the size of this plant. So being intentional about including clues to scale, sometimes you know I'll have something, and we'll see an example of this later on. I've drawn something life-size, but I didn't make a note of it. You'll see in an upcoming slide how, like, you know, it really would have been helpful to have included that little note for scale. You'll see why it makes a big difference. When I'm also, when I'm working on my field guide drawings, I often draw them life-size, so then I actually automatically know how big this thing is. So quantification, here again. This is one way of exploring something, and I kind of get a sense of part of the world of this bird, but there's a completely different part that's recorded right here. Recording its behavior over 20 minutes. The number of times that it's missed its prey, four times, and at the same time it caught four bullfrogs and one fish. That's a lot of food. That's a successful bidder. Right? But that's quantification. And see what happens when I just let those numbers into play. That tells a different part of the story. It would be hard to show with a picture. But I'm paying attention to time, I'm paying attention to numbers. That's quantification. Here's another example of that. I went out and drew a poppy that was starting to grow every day. And I noticed that it sort of has this growth spurt. At the same time, I would go out multiple times in the, in, during that day, and I would count, I would measure the distance from this node down here to up where the flower started. And I recorded that here, and this is a graph of it. So you can see it sort of has this, goes up, 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 and levels out. And you can see this growing up, and then leveling out right there. 
So same sort of information included in two ways. Doing that is going to help me ask questions and think about things that I otherwise might not pay attention to. Here's another example of, uh, of, 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 of quantification that um, was another recent sort of fun discovery. And it comes from just letting yourself measure what you see. One of the things I carry with me is a little protractor. It allows me to measure angles. And I was noticing that as, uh, so if I'm sitting here on the, the shore and I'm looking out here towards the sun, out here in the water, all the mallards had blue and purple heads. And when I looked this direction away from the sun, they had green heads. And what it was is we discovered that, you know, you could pick up the spot at which the color would shift from blue into green depending on its angle from the sun. So I was measuring that, and this was my way of sort of recording these different colors and positions and their relative angles to me in the sun. It is a beautiful pattern that comes out of paying attention to the... Uh, to just a little bit of, it's a beautiful pattern and becomes even more interesting when I'm able to quantify it like that. So measuring reveals something beautiful that is going on here. Same thing right here. This was a tree that um, deer were browsing it at its base. Here's a little part that got up above deer level and started to branch out. And I measured all sorts of things all over this tree. Um, so I have the length of the section which has been rubbed bare by the deer's antlers. When it wasn't eating it, it was, they rubbed their antlers here. So here's this antler rub. And I now have the length of a mule deer, black-tailed deer antler rub. And when I'm in uh, Wyoming and I'm looking at an elk rub on a tree, I've already got something to compare it to. And that's, that's neat. That's interesting. How far in this way do you get these things all trimmed nicely? That gives me an idea of the neck length of the deer. How high off the ground can it reach up to nibble a leaf? And then um, I drew one of the leaves from down here and from up here. See, this is where I should have, I should have put in this little one over one here. These were drawn life size. Isn't that interesting? They're much smaller leaves down here, much bigger leaves up here. So I should have put in a little scale thing there. All right, you can see how that's like, yeah, that would be, that's really relevant here. The other thing that I did is I just started counting, again, counting, quantifying things. How many spines are there around this little leaf? And how many are there around this one here? And I discovered down on the bottom where the deer can nibble, they have little leaves with lots of spines, and up here they have big leaves with a few spines on them. Isn't that amazing? I also tried chewing on them to see if there was a taste difference. Didn't really pick up anything. But but that's those are patterns that come from counting and measuring. And because I was doing all this counting, I just thought, oh, I'm going to count that. And this is da, 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 da. If you're doing something where you're counting something and you get a big list of numbers, this becomes very, very hard for us to intuitively interpret. Right? I look at this and I go like, well, there's a lot of numbers. Right? Um, now, some people may be natural statisticians and they kind of go, oh, the mean and the standard deviation of this would be, and they like to calculate those things. I have a very difficult time with calculating. Um, but what I want to do is to show you a way to turn a list of measurements like this into something, into a picture that you can visualize. And this is a really crazy powerful tool. And um, so imagine that you're going through a forest and you're finding a number of a kind of, there's, there are plants that are growing up and you're measuring how many centimeters they're tall. You get sort of the, sort of a sense of how tall these things are and you write down a bunch of those measurements. That's hard to interpret. 
But what I could do just as easily, instead of writing 25, 38, 63, 54, 40, right? I could do it this way. I'm going to draw a vertical line, and this is my stem. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so on. And then what I'm going to do is, as I take my first measurement, let's say that's 25, I'm going to go, here's my 20, and I'm going to put my 5 right there. That means 25. 38 would be that. 63 is that. 54, 49, 43, 36, 77, 82, 64. You get the idea, right? 58, I'll do all right? So what I'm doing is I'm just adding a number on that same line. This same data set done in this style looks like this. Ooh. You see the power of that? You can look at it and visualize The spread of the data, sort of the average, what it's going to be, how far out that spreads, that's incredibly powerful. And we can visualize, it turns numbers into a picture. This is called a stem leaf plot. Let's say you then walk up to the ridge line and you take a look at a whole other group of, of the same kind of plant, but there's a whole other patch of them, and they're on this windblown ridge now, and you're looking at them and you're thinking, they seem a little bit shorter here, don't they? Well, that one's kind of larger, but they seem a little bit shorter. I measure those, you know, comparing this bunch of numbers with this one, who knows? But if I took that data, instead of putting it into here and, and then transferring it to here, just as I'm going, I can go 25. Right, 38. Right, um, I can put that same. Oops, that was 83. <laughs> That's what happens when dyslexics try to do their data. Um, this is how it looks. Can you explain this, one more time how you did that. Sure, because this, this is this is a really really kind of useful thing. It starts with the stem, where I'm just going to go zero, one, two, three, four, five. These are like the tens place, right? What are you measuring? Well, this, this would be sort of, um, it, here's my plant growing up, right? I'm just measuring in centimeters how tall it is. Tall. Okay. Right? Or this could be anything. I could be, this could be diameter of trees. This could be um, number of, of, of um, pecs per minute. This could be anything that you're quantifying and getting a whole sort of series of numbers. Instead of recording them this way, I'm going to just put them onto a plot like this. And then when I get 38, I would go to the, so the 3 is the tens place, and I'd go 38. And if I get 32, I would go on the same row, 32. And it's just showing me that I've got another thing in my 30s place. Right? Does that make sense? I think it's, it's, it's a very powerful way of visualizing and recording information. You can record information in a way that you can visualize it. So you don't have to do this and then do that. You can go straight to there. Is that fun? Numbers can be beautiful. Numbers can also confuse us. Um, and for small numbers, we can easily look at it and say, oh, how many ducks are, how many geese are here? You didn't even have to count them, right? You automatically knew what you're looking at. But um, you know, same thing here. I'm going to show you another slide really quickly. When you look at it, try to just get a quick hit estimation of how many are there. All right? And I come up with a feeling instead of, oh, some geese. All right? Come up with a number in your head. And then, um, once you kind of see what your initial hit is, you can then try to count. How well did you do? Right on. <laughs> Excellent. Right? So with lower numbers, we're going to do pretty well. Right? 
Um, and the more we practice it, the better we get at it. But we often don't practice it. Right? Therefore, we're not really good at it. Um, yeah. Something like this, <laughs> what people do is they say there were countless geese. <laughs> right? Countless ends up then being really overused. But why countless? Why don't you actually try to count them? And there are some ways that you can train yourself to um, count large numbers of things. But it can be really confusing. And we often think we are much better at it than, um, than we actually are. I was on a Christmas bird count with a group of really amazing uh, birders. And they were out there with their binoculars. They were looking around and they were... Um, uh, they would walk up to this lake and they, they, this one area would say, all right, the members would say, all right, I'll, I'll take uh, the white-fronted geese. And they would look out and say, all right, um, 2,500 white fronts. And the person said, okay, now I'm going to do the Canada, right? And they would throw out these numbers. And I was, like, I was impressed. I was going like, man, that's good. That's really good. And this person's like, they're counting the Mallard's numbers. They'd all do these different ones. And I'd be like, oh, boy. And I was like, I was curious about what would happen if we were all trying to do the same bird. What would we get? And so I said, let's all do the same one. Right? By the way, just a footnote, we had plenty of time for a very relaxed lunch, all those other sorts of things. But when I suggested that we all do it, they're like, uh, no, actually, for time considerations, we'd better not. <laughs> Scared? Scared because... We have high confidence in something that we've practiced a lot, but there's no valid way of validating that what we've got. So you can get a really strong sense of being correct, but no way of determining if you actually are. So some people think that, uh, that, that, that you know, there's, there's research that shows that if you just practice something a lot, you get good at it, right? It's actually a slight misinterpretation of the data. It's not just practice makes perfect. It's perfect practice makes perfect. What that means is there has to be a feedback loop between what you're doing and what you're just practicing golf swing like that a lot is not going to improve you. If there's somebody actually correcting your form, right, then you're going to get better at it. But there's no feedback if you just kind of walk up and say, oh, it's this, right? Um, and so then this flock of geese flew up and I actually got everybody in the group to to give us their estimation of how many birds are there in that flock. And um, we took a photograph of the flock, too. And so we're then able to figure out how many birds were in that. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, um, about 2,000 birds. Right. Um, in most people's estimations, they were between five and seven hundred to a thousand birds off. Right? So, we think we know what it is. But you can actually get good at estimating these things through practice and by training yourself how to count large numbers. And so, um, what you want to do is to kind of get, we don't have, we've got a sense of what three looks like, but for larger numbers, we don't. And so what you want to do is to learn, this is what 50 looks like. That's how 50 looks. And to look at that, you've got to go 50. 50. That's 50. That's 50. If that's 50, how much is that? 75. 100. 75 or 100. Yep, this ends up being, this is what 100 looks like. This is what 150 looks like. Right. Um, but we don't really have an intuitive sense of kind of how to visualize these large numbers. One way of, of training yourself to kind of count these sorts of things is to count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and look at 10 and hold your hand up and go, hey, that's 10. That's 10, that's 10. They go 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, right? And count by tens. Or you can count by 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Then go, okay, 50, 50. That's 50. Okay, that's 50, 50, 50, 100, 150. That's about 150 birds. So what you're doing is you are clumping things and counting by those units. So what I often will do is I'll count by tens to 50. All right, then count by 50s 
you know, to 100, get my, you know, or if it's a smaller group, I would count by 50, 50, 50. If it was a huge group, I would then count, okay, that's 100, that's 100, all right, now that's 100, that's 200, that's 300, that's 400, right? So you're kind of getting an oomph sense of things. Let's give it a try with this. Sort of give yourself sort of an initial kind of, all right, that is what 10 looks like. If that's 10, how many dots are there without counting every one? Did you count everyone? You're right. That's what 40 looks like. Alright? Good job. Now, what we're going to do is you're going to count by 10. So, so here, you just by 10, 10, 10. Alright? Now, now, <laughs> there we go. Oh boy. Alright, so what you're going to do is you're going to count by 10s to 50, and then count by 50s. So get yourself 50, and first just kind of like, you know, count 50, and then hold 50. You can actually hold your hand out and say, that's 50. That's 50. Hold it in your hands and go close one eye so you can kind of hold it in your hand. Yeah, that's 50. That's that. That's that. That's that. That's that. 250 to 300. 250 to 300. Yeah. In these initial estimations, don't worry if you get the wrong answer. You want to actually pay attention to whether or not you tend to estimate high or low. Um, because you may have, if you're lucky, you'll have a systematic bias. And knowing that can help you adjust. Uh, this is 400. How many is that? Without counting every bird, how many is that? Something to be very aware of, though, is something <coughs> called the anchoring effect. If you hear somebody else say a number, people will start to cluster around that number because we don't want to be alone. I lose count. When someone says another number, I'm like, ah, I'm done. I can't. <laughs> Do you have a number? Yeah, there are 28 birds there. But, oh, this is kind of uh, interesting. Often you'll see a flock flying like this where, where one <laughs> side is a lot longer than the other. Do you know why that is? Something to do with the wind? There's more birds on that side. More what? <laughs> <laughs> More birds on that side. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, um, moving right along. Um, the, um, so you can do this, but it takes training. Um, I spent some time once with um, a group of wildlife biologists, and in the evening, what they would do is um, they would get out a dark cloth, and they would set it out on the floor, and one of them, they had uh, little white beans, and they would put those out there, and the person who put them out knew how many were there. And they'd have everybody first do a flash estimation, and then a clumping count. And these people were able to get there for large numbers. They would like, you know, have, you know, here's, you know, 672 beans out there. And they'd be like, they're like I'm getting 650, these sorts of things. I was like, man. I was like, we're there 20. Um, it, it, you can actually can train yourself to do this. So that's a, a very useful, valuable way of um, further uh, training this skill. So you can add those counts into your field notes if you're keeping track of what you see. Um, but something that you have to be wary of is, let's say you kind of estimate that there are 450 birds on one pond. And then you come around a corner, and there's another little pond there with seven birds on it. What do you write in your field notes? How many birds are there? 
450. Why? Why 450? It's just from rounding it off. Right. So you, if you put that seven in there, it implies that you've got that level of. It gives you this false accuracy, right? This false specificity. If you've kind of been clumping by fifties, right? You can't say 457. It account implies that I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, 457. Right? If I can kind of mass in my head, I've got right there's seven more birds. If I can get like another chunk of 50, I can add them into this. But I don't want to. I'm going to um, have my number represent the level of rounding that I'm actually doing in my counting. So if I'm roughly counting by, you know, that field has 3,000 in that, that one has 8,000 in that field, and 20 over here, right? I'm, I'm clumping things by thousands. And I'm not going to give my data then a false sense of accuracy and precision by, um, or I should say, a, 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 a false sense of, um, yeah, of, 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 of the accuracy of, of what I'm looking at by accuracy by by adding that seven on the end. Does that make sense? Another thing that we want to be able to it's actually useful to instead of looking at numbers. Another thing that's very useful to think about is how can I estimate percent cover? How much of this slide is covered by clouds? What percent? There may be an anchoring effect going on here because most people in the room agree at 60. Right? It's interesting to, to, to think how powerful that anchoring is. That's why in negotiating things, the first person who says, I think that that base is worth $20, actually has set a big part of the conversation. That's going to anchor a lot of the discussion around it or a salary negotiation. Um, so what I did is I took this slide, I put it into Photoshop, I selected all the blue and had the computer calculate what percent of this was. And so I don't know if that's accurate, but it gave me 73% cloud cover. Mm. Right? Getting a uh, of what this looks like, like what does 70% look like? I once saw a chart like this one in a geology book. And I thought it was brilliant and really, really useful. Mm -hmm. It allowed you to estimate like how much of this rock is mica. It also allows you to get a sense of what does 50, what does seventy percent look like? What does twenty percent look like? All right? And having that in your head actually makes your, your estimates of things much more accurate and useful. And so um, what I did is I made this chart, I made this chart and thought I brought it with me for all of you, which I've got right here. <laughs> Somewhere. Oh, yes, here they are. They're just hiding in that other secret compartment. All right, so I have, okay, so for friends at home, you can download this, download this off my website for free. Go check it out. It has, oops, I'll put it out of the, um, it has this chart. It has a list of the sort of journal elements and things to kind of be reminders. It has the, the Beaufort wind scale. So that's a way of estimating wind speed. So you can't say, you don't have to just say, it's a rather windy day. You've got a way of kind of quantifying that that is um, sort of comparable to other events. There's a protractor. There's a millimeter and an inches ruler. And uh, something else very cool in the middle saying biometrics, which we'll explain at the end of this workshop. So everybody gets one of these. You can trim it to fit in your journal. Um, and the, uh, there you go. Absolutely. Isn't that fun? Yes, this is great. This is awesome. Oops. There you go. And um, hard to tell thirty from forty. Hard to tell thirty from forty. Mm -hmm. And um, the uh, but you know gives you 
at least a feeling for it. Mm -hmm. um, and at least it gets you in the right ballpark. Yeah. What percent cloud cover? Everybody have a number in their head? So you're just doing the sky, you're cutting the grass. Oh, we don't cut, we don't cut the grass. That's right. So forget the grass, just the sky here. Does everybody have a number in their head? Again, um, be gentle with yourself in these. Um, but you sort of have a number. Yes, ready to go? This is 15% cloud cover. We'll try one more. This is a toughie. And forget these little cirrus clouds back here. I'm counting those as blue. So those puffy clouds in there. Sixty. You have your guess. So. Um, what I did uh, again, so I, I so what I, the number that I got from my um, by putting this into Photoshop. Um, what did you get? Fifty. Fifty. Sixty. Sixty-six. Forty. So we are. Um, it's sort of interesting when you take sort of a bunch of estimates. Very often, kind of averaging those, you get this sort of group wisdom. It's fifty. Yeah. Actually, technically, it's forty forty-eight percent. <coughs> the more you practice it, the better you'll get. If you can find a way of practicing it where you get some feedback, the nice thing about this is we actually know um, that really helps a lot. One last thing I'd like you to think about adding into your journal are lists. And um, this comes very naturally to some birders, right? and, but I think that they take it to a painful extreme where the purpose is the list. The purpose is how many did you see in one day? And that ends up actually losing when it's all aggregated together, this is what I saw over the course of one day, it loses its biological significance. Because that's a list aggregated over when I walked through that habitat and that habitat and that habitat and that habitat, then drove in my car to this other place and saw these other things sort of here. So that's an interesting as sort of what my experience was. I got to see a lot of these things. But actually doesn't contain ecological information. If you make a mini list that is specific to one place, when I was in the Redwood Forest, this is what I saw. Then when I was out in the Chaparral, this is what I saw. That becomes incredibly, incredibly interesting and useful. So mini lists in your notebooks, right? Also is more helpful because, you know, like before you walk out of the Redwood Forest into the Chaparral, just take notes, sort of just jot down your best sort of recollection of what your approximate numbers were. Um, this is my favorite list of all time. It was made by a young naturalist, and she was out exploring with her, her mom and daddy. And um, she was, look at this metadata up here, the date, location. It's wonderful. It's brilliant. Right? And what does she have? Okay, one helicopter. Four crows. There's a number of gulls, black Phoebe. And then she found dandelions. <laughs> I love this. Right? And she's counted them up for you. That's 485. All right? Wonderful. Right? It just makes me, it makes me really happy. Um, I want to go exploring with her. Um, and she's, she's, she's picked up on something that is really important biologically going on in this place. There's a lot of dandelions in bloom right now. Right? Um, these sort of notes, if they languish in our nature journals, they're useful to us. And the next time you go to that place, you'll be able to say, last time I was here, I found four black feeties. Right? useful for you, but we can also actually share that information with a larger community of naturalists. So there are places where you can take your little lists and put them into a commonly shared communal database. The computer keeps, the, this is a free website that keeps track of how many birds you've seen in your life this year, all those sort of list things that bird listers like to do. But it also keeps track of, oh you saw that here, when was that? And then we have this, we're able to make distribution lists of in that specific place. What is the abundance of different sorts of things over the course of the year? And even
spatially across the entire country. What is where when? And this kind of data becomes incredibly useful to us now because we have real-time information now about where birds are today because of these the data that amateur naturalists are feeding into the system. This next slide is real data collected by naturalists just like us from this system of Lasley Buntings over the course of one year. So this is real collected data by people like us. January, February, March, migrating north, April, May, June, breeding, post-breeding dispersal, starting to head south, aggregating, kind of feeding before the big flight south, and November. Amazing. Amazing. Beautiful data. Beautiful data. And we can help contribute to this. And science really needs it right now. We need to know how are real-time things responding to this. So I want to encourage us as naturalists not to just hoard our data, but to share it with some of these, these, these sites that really ups the impact of what we're able to do. This is a great way of quickly documenting um, your, your list of, of, of who you saw, where, when. Um, you can make little four-letter codes out of the names of things. And the general formula is that if a, if a critter has four-word name, like yellow-crowned night heron, you take the first letter of each, yellow-crowned night heron, Y-C-N-H. Right? If it just has one word, like osprey, you take the first four of that. Morning dove, you go mo, do. You see how that works? Yeah. And then for words with ones with three words in their name, great crested flycatcher, it's G-C-F-L. Right? And um, for ones that are hyphenated, they sort of usually take, um, if it's a hyphenated word, they take the first, whether it comes at the start or the end, they're going to take two from the unhyphenated and one from the hyphenated. And so that's, that's sort of just sort of a standardized way of creating these codes. Then there are some exceptions because some birds, for instance, their codes end up overlapping. Um, you know, a green kingfisher and a great kiskity give you the same code. And so there are some exception ones that, that, that people um, make. Um, and you can either memorize what those are or what I usually do in my field notes is I can't keep track of those with my dyslexic brain right now. I'll sometimes I have a little list of what some of those exceptions are in the back of my book, and if I don't have that, I just kind of wing it, and I figure that um, if I write, I see a black-throated green warbler, and I'm in the oak woodlands, nobody's really going to assume that I'm seeing a. So if I see a black-throated gray warbler, nobody's going to assume that I'm seeing a black-throated green warbler because of the location and that other sort of thing. So it makes sense to me and allows me to quickly kind of come up with these. If you can get some of those um, uh, exceptions and, and, and learn them, it's a fun thing to do, and then you can kind of quiz your friends. But so, you know, here I've got just a quick little list. This doesn't take up very much space, right? It's fast to do, and it's biologically incredibly significant. How are numbers of, change, of things changing over time? We really want to know. We want to have that in our data. So that is the art of making lists. That coupled with your ability to estimate numbers, and you, my friend, are gold. The next thing I want to do is just quickly show you, so what we've done is these are things that you can include in any journal page, right? And, but what I also want to do is suggest that there are ways of doing an exploration in a place that will get you out of the box of the way that you normally think. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with um, one of these examples. Of, this is like showing you kind of something that a lot of people do when we do our nature journaling, as an example of a thing to do, and then show you some different ways that you can give yourself a little journaling project that will stimulate you to notice different sorts of things. All right. So this is what a lot of us do in our nature journals. We see a group of storks, there's some cool marabou storks there, and I start writing down what I see about them and drawing pictures and recording my information about them. Right? The more that I do throw together a bunch on one page, the more that these different elements start to have a conversation with each other, and it becomes really, really, really interesting. It also becomes easier to take your, record your information there as the critter is moving around. 
I'm bouncing around from one drawing to the next. When it comes back to a pose I've already started and move, or moves to a different pose, I'll either start a new drawing or jump over to something that I'm already working on. By having a lot of these going simultaneously, it helps me kind of keep on going. So I want to encourage people to get kind of a crowded page. Let more be in there. Use writing, use drawing together. I think of this as what I would call a species account. I want to record as much as I can, learn about this species. Another thing, though, that I can do is not a species account, but to pick a focal individual. An individual and interview it. So here's an interview with a flower. All right? Not a species of flower, but this individual one with this little brown spot on this leaf, with this spider web right here. I want to get myself to look at what is happening right here on this one rather than this species as a whole. What's going on with this individual? Very often when you focus on one individual, you'll notice things that you wouldn't if your brain is kind of backed up and thinking at a species level. We recognize differences between human faces, and we don't think that all the rest of the species out there have all these differences in them. And they are as different, one from another, as we are from each other. If we let ourselves slow down and look at it, every robin in your garden is different than every other one. You can recognize the individuals that are coming. It's amazing. Um, you'll notice some of these other sorts of things. You know, here is metadata, here's asking <coughs> questions. All of those things can be in there together. Um, but that's, so this is the individual interview. Another way that you can think about things is by changing the, the distance, the scale at which you are drawing or exploring something. And be really intentional about that. So, if I draw a life-size plant, I can also take part of that and zoom in and really go in close. And I will learn different things. And when I get back further, I will notice, oh my gosh, look, the lower leaves of um, uh, miner's lettuce have these sort of paddle shapes. I thought they were all these little discs. I've never seen those before. And you notice that because you get them a little bit further out. Right? And you get even further out, and you realize, oh, they're all growing under the shade of the trees. That's not something that you notice when you're focused in at this level. Here's another example of zooming in and zooming out. I get in close with these pelicans, and I go, my gosh, look at the different colors. It's the same time of year, but look at all the different sorts of um, patterns and, and things. What's going on with their molt and timing? What's, what's, what's happening here with this? All in the same place. That's really interesting. I zoom out a little bit more, and I realize that the pelicans all sit very, very close together and all sorts of different crazy directions, not all lined up like the shorebirds. I get out even further and I realize that all the pelicans sit in one pile on the beach and all the gulls sit in another group more spread out with that each other. Like, so what's going on socially here? These guys are really densely clumped. The gulls are all spaced out. Those are observations that you make at different dis dis distances. So intentionally zoom in, intentionally zoom out. You will see different things. When you get unclose, you'll learn how it closes its eye. When you zoom out, you'll realize that the one with the big beak and the big waddle on its throat is the most dominant one and walks around pulling everybody's tail feathers. Observations made when you back out and look at the big picture. Observations made when you zoom in. Do both. This next one, I think, is a ton of fun. It's making behavior storyboards or a comic book. Let me explain. You see a cool sequence of behavior. The first thing I do when I see a sequence of behavior is I say out loud, I saw this, then I saw this, then I saw this, and I saw this. I say it out loud. That helps me remember the sequence. And then I can make a little step-by-step -step storyboard. Right? Puffs throat out, face off with head uh, flicks, loud calls, tandem run, dive simultaneously, emerge separately. Right? I make myself a little comic 
of those events. And that can be in sort of a cartoon style, just very representative drawings, but shows the order of events. I'm interested in telling the story. Or I can be more accurate with those little drawings, or somewhere in between. But that's a great way of recording behavior of things. Here's another example of that. Hard to see, I know, in the back. Um, but this was looking at some bittern feeding with its head up, and the head was wobbling, and then the head lowers, and it takes a careful step, and then there's a sudden lunge. Got a bullfrog swallows head first with one gulp. So that's a little cartoon down the side showing the sequence of events. And one more for you. So this one started with, I thought that this was all going to be, that this was going to be it. I was looking at, um, I started looking at the clumping of things and their orientation, and I noticed that on the beach all the shorebirds were together and whatever, there were these ring-billed gulls that all the shorebirds had backed away from. Sort of I decided that the ring-billed gull was the boss of the beach. And I thought that that was the end of the story. And I was packing up my stuff to leave and turn around, and in flies this huge western gull. Right? Just a one gull size larger, and this is what happens. All the shorebirds take off, all right? A few willets way out there. The ringbill gulls kind of scampered like this, got out of there. And wow, you know, that's, that's, that's the boss of the beach right there. Um, and I just drew that down below it. And here is a little step-by-step -step storyboard. It tells the story. So little step-by-step -step drawings are a great way of describing behaviors and interactions. Because a behavior is this sequence, what happened then and what happened then and what happened then. Say it out loud to help you keep track in your head of what was the order of events. Another very powerful way of improving your ability to perceive and notice details is to compare things. So if I say that this plant, uh, if I'm looking at a plant, it's hard for me to say if it is hairy or not, because I do not have, and it might not even really register to me, if I don't see hairs on it, to say, it's not hairy, right? Yeah. Or, and what's, what's even more powerful, though, is to have something to compare it with. Because it's a hairy compared to what? It's smooth compared to what? It's shiny, shinier than what, right? Um, when you have two things right next to each other, you go, wow. You see that one, it's really shiny because that one is dull. It's that contrast between the two that really makes the characteristics pop out. So in looking at an elderberry, I can actually notice a lot more things about it and really kind of find some interesting things going on. How is its branching really different than what's going on on the buckeye? And this kind of parallel construction between two similar sorts of things. I found two species of lupin, large leaf lupin and Tories lupin. This is this little one with tall spikes of flowers grew about a foot and a half off the ground, this four foot tall, big leaved lupin, right? Look at the spacing of the flowers on this. I mean, it wouldn't really stick with me that this is super dense until I compare it with that. Right? I might not add in my notes that this is really dense packed flowers. And this one isn't. And look at this. You know, dry, hot, sandy soil, full sun, grows in cool shade, deeper soil, big leaves, flat, not hairy, hairy, small leaves. You know, because I've got these two things side by side, I can start to really pick up on those differences and see things in the individuals that I otherwise wouldn't pick up on. The collection is another really fun way to go about things, to kind of get you out of your box. If what you usually do is you walk out there and you sort of find a bird and sit down and you draw that bird, that's your routine. Here's how to shatter that. What you're going to do is you're going to make a collection. You're going to give yourself a little project. Today, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to find what do icicles do? What do icicles do? Icicles on branches. And I'm going to walk around and I'm going to find a bunch of icicles on branches. Right? I'm giving myself this little project, a narrow focus, and I'm going to make a collection of icicles in my journal. I'm going to make a collection of birds with brown stains on their tummies in the pond. Right? And 
That narrow focus pulls me in a very specific and curious investigation that I otherwise would not do. And these can be seasonal. It can be fall. I'm going to go, I'm going to do fall fruits. Or I'm going to try to find as many um, kind of shades of, of color in, um, in, in leaves. What, are, what, are sort of, what is the, the spectrum of, of leaf color that I can find on, on fallen leaves? What, um, in spring, I'm going to try to find as many buds as I can. What do the buds of all these different things? Can I find, um, uh, what are the smallest um, plants that I can find that haven't started flowering yet? Whatever it is, a little project can really take you very, very far. And it gets you thinking about things that you don't normally, normally think about. Somebody in our, 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 one of my other classes had this wonderful idea. It was Sylvia said that um, what she does is she says, um, I'm going to go and do a different project each day, right? And here's what I use to kind of trigger it. I say, it's Monday, all right, what am I going to do? Um, M, Monday, M, 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 Mushroom Monday. I'm going to go out and try to find as many kind of things, mushrooms as I can out here, all right? Um, and the next Monday might be, she's walking around her house and she's going to go, oh, it's Moth Monday now, right? And she's going to try to look by all the lights and find how many different kinds of moths she can. On Wednesday, it will be Wildflower Wednesday. Spider Saturday. And so she gives herself a little project of something that she normally would, and that, that little, just the, the day of the week kind of triggers it. What an interesting way to kind of get yourself out of your regular box. Another interesting way to get yourself out of your box is to create, is to look, is to time travel. To time travel with your journal. And to do that, we're going to make a timeline. We human beings do not see change that is slow. I'm going to change something on this slide, and I want you to see if you can catch it when it happens. If so, don't call it out, but I'm going to change something here and see if you can catch it when it happens. So look in there, see if you can catch that change when it happens. And... Did you see it? Anybody? One person? Yeah. Now I'm going to change it quickly and see how easy it is. Are you ready? You, it happened in front of you, but you didn't see it. It was invisible to you because it was slow. Watch. But because it is slow, we don't see gradual change. It's invisible to us. So things that are happening on plant time seem not to happen at all to us. And um, so one way you can do that is to time travel and kind of get moments in time preserved in your journal. This is one poppy through time. So this is May 17th, 7 a.m., 7.22, the cap comes off, 8.30, right? This is the next day, in the morning and the evening, the day after that, coming through time, as the seed pod finally grows, after the petals of the seed pod falls off, opens up on July 25th, and has 95 seeds inside, I count. Time travel. And you can do that in your journal. Here's time travel in one day. <clears throat> one poppy, one day, from morning to evening. Closed in the morning, opened up during the day, and then closed back up. Sometimes there's a bee inside. <laughs> and the other thing that was interesting, the way that it rolled itself back up at the end was different than the way that it rolled itself out at the start. Here is time travel with my Trader Joe's orchid. Right? So um, it, this thing started to grow, grew up, 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 and then pow, this crazy thing. So here's like that diagramming thing going on again. Right? The little parts. You know, how does that look from different angles? And there would be another one after this, but 
my little daughter picked it. So. <laughs> Daddy, flower. Uh, bless her heart. Um, here it is with an iris. This is the same day. This was at 6 in the morning. I had to wake up. I, I, was, I knew it was going to happen, so I woke up really early. I was like, come on, come on, go. I know you're going to go today. Right? So I got it, pop. And then it did that same day by 8.30. Right? Next day at 7 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And then that, and then that, and then it wilted. And then this other thing, so this blue, purple spike starts to come up there. And it turns into this other flower. And that opens, and then it starts to curl up and wilt. But it wilts in a slightly different way than the other one. And then the whole thing starts to darken and turn brown. And then my neighbor, we wrecked it. <laughs> um, but, again, that's time travel. It's, and there's all sorts of questions and, and, and observations that come up. Uh, this is, just was filled with, with, with questions about what's happening. Why are there ants on it at some times and not on others? What are they doing? When are they coming in? What is their role? How are they connecting with this? All those sorts of things come from time traveling. Um, you can also time travel in one day. This is just one afternoon with a group of poppies. So start with a poppy drawing and then how far can I take this into the past? How can, does that happen? How far can I go forward? into the future, looking around one place. So not just making a portrait of something, can I get sort of a sense of the life cycle of this? That's time travel. You see how each one of these gets you thinking in a different way, wondering different things. You will wonder different, very different things if you are time traveling than if you are making a map. Last one here is map making, either top view or a cross section. Or you can do them both together. You can do these independently or together. Just, you know, I'm going to now make a cross section about across this part of the pond. Doing this makes you think about a place ecologically. And the sorts of things that you'll think about, the questions that you ask, totally different if you're doing this than this. All sorts of stories and patterns. This, what you're trying to do is get yourself to see the patterns in the place that you're in. And just the framing it a little bit differently will, um, will, will allow you to, 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 things will be revealed to you that you otherwise would not have seen. Little Amer uh, flycatcher singing right in there. This is crazy advanced mapping for those who really want to uh, go nuts on it. This is a combination of the top view with cross sections. Uh, I'll, I'll put up a blog post of kind of the process that I did to do this. If this is, um, uh, is kind of an, an, it can be sort of an initially intimidating thing, I suggest starting with something like this. But at some point, if you're like, I have a bunch of time on your hand and you want to just sort of be playful and kind of goof around with it, these are actually really fun to do. This was my April Fool's Day adventure on San Bruno Mountain. This is where I got to, the first time I'd ever got to draw my little weather symbols with a downpour and lightning bolts. So I was really excited to go out and journal this day because I wanted to, wanted to record my weather that way. I'd never done that, so it was a good day to do that. Um, kind of what, oh, and look at this. All right, here is... Um, Numbers of birds, notice for like um, the, uh, the wren tit, uh, the white crowned sparrow, those sorts of things, the common raven. I'm actually getting the exact number of birds with little tally marks. And for the uh, common bush tit and the cedar waxwings, which came flew in these big flocks, those are estimated rounded to the nearest ten. Yes? How do you know you're not counting the same birds over again? Um, because I was sort of traveling through different habitats. And um, at this time of year, they're, they're going to be on territory and not, um, these are birds that were kind of getting up and I'd most often encounter them when they'd be, you know, up and, and active and singing. And you'd never do that on somebody else's turf because you get beat up. So their behavior kind of helped me uh, not run into that. Um, here's kind of the process that I went to, through to doing that. I first just sort of drew myself a cube. And on the edges of that cube, I drew the cross-section of the land over there on that side of me and the land over there on that side of me, and in the front and back. So these are just what I was sort of estimating the cross-section of the land in those areas look like. And 
Then uh, on one of our field trips coming up, we'll, we'll I'll, I'll sort of do one of these and sort of show you how it looks. And you'll see that there's a lot of wiggle room and a lot of room for air, but they're a lot of fun. Um, and then I drew a line up the tops of, of the, the, the ridge line there and on the bottom of the valley. And that gave me the reference points in order to kind of construct my land. And then on top of this, I make a little key for how, what I want to do for, for different types of plants. And then can show where on here, and often I kind of get cute. I just like having fun making waterfalls off the sides of these. <laughs> Sometimes I'll draw myself on the edge and you know, throwing rocks over or whatever. Um, and uh, we can also put in where you find different sorts of critters. <coughs> it's a lot of fun to do. It gets you sort of thinking ecologically in a different sorts of place. And it gives you a real sense of intimacy with the place. Doing that, obviously, makes you think about this landscape in a very different way than if you're doing a timeline. So those are all possibilities for you. And I've got the list of them there on your, on your, on your thing. There's one more thing which we can do to add to our, our toolkit of curiosity. One more tool that I want to put in there. I want us all to know our pace. To know your pace. To know, as you walk, how far you go with each footstep. And if you know that number, how many feet per step, you can measure all sorts of distances. Um, if you see a tree, you can stand afar away from it, hold your pencil up, and just swing it down to the ground, have a buddy stand there, and then walk back, and you know how tall that tree is. Right? Um, you can get the distance from the fox den to the stream. You can, get, you can start to measure larger distances. A little millimeter ruler is good for this distance. But for those larger distances, knowing your pace is magic. Right? And so what we're going to do in a moment is we're going to walk outside, and I'm going to put out a 100-foot tape. And you're going to start Imagine that this is one end of the hundred and this is the other. You're going to start a little bit outside of the hundred so that as you go into it, you're walking just with your normal relaxed walking pace, how you normally walk. So not taking big strides or little strides, how you normally walk. You're going to walk across it once, get your number, walk back, get that same number. Hopefully they're the same number, right? And then you're going to come in here and do a little bit of math. And what you're going to do is, you went 100 feet, you're going to divide 100 by the number of steps, and you'll get feet per step. Take your feet per step, multiply that by 0 0.3048, and you now have that in meters. All right? And on your uh, page, there's a little thing that says biometrics. There's a place in there to write in your feet per step and to write in your meters per step. Because I always figure it out, and then I always forget my pace. Right? But if you've got it written down, you're gold. You ready? So, um, friends at home, um, you can do this yourself. Measure out 100 feet. Um, do these calculations. Download that sheet. You can put it um, into your, your, your journal. The most important thing is to just get yourself out and start to play with a bunch of these different ways of framing, thinking about your nature journaling. If there's something in here that you've seen that this might be fun, you think that would be, I think that'd be really, really fun to try. Get out there and do a, just a playful investigation and see what you start to wonder about, see what you start to think about. And all sorts of surprises and mysteries are going to reveal themselves to you. And it makes being alive so much more interesting and so much more fun. All right? I'm now going to put this out here. Thank you for watching. Thank you for joining me here. And I hope you had a great time at this Nature Journal Club workshop.